You're listening to The Stark Truth with Robert Stark. Visit us on the web at www.starktruthradio.com. This is uh, Robert Stark. I'm joined here with uh, my co-host, Pillator. Uh, Adventure Kid will be uh, joining us uh, shortly, but before he gets on, uh, Pillator has some very uh, uh, important films to discuss. Yeah, I mean, one of the films we were actually discussing and talking about earlier was uh, The Crush from 1993, and I mentioned this before, The Amazing Panda Adventure from 1995. Yeah, they did come around in the same time, and uh, you I've seen The Great Panda Adventure when I was a kid, and I've, uh, I've seen, I saw The Crush, too. <laughs> I think that second film, it, it kind of had, had the impact on me that The Great Panda Adventure had on you. You know, eh, well, here's the thing. It's like The Crush uh, stars, uh, what's her name, um, Alicia Silverstone. And The Amazing Panda Adventure also stars a little-known actress named uh, Yang Ding. And if you compare the two, one is uh, an Israeli-Aryan woman and the other Chinese. And so both films have some esoteric energy bringing out the duality between Israeli-Aryanism through The Crush and Asian-Aryanism through The Amazing Panda Adventure. Well, Amazing Panda Adventure is kind of an innocent story of uh, two children who have this adventure in China, and but there's that one scene where they uh, they fall into the waterfall. Uh, with yeah. the crush, it's kind of like a cheesy, like early '90s, like psychological thriller. Like I kind of remember, I was like eight years old, but I remember when the commercials were out. I mean, it's a it's a good film, but it's it's kind of cheesy. But there's there's that Some, part where he's yeah, it's actually very suspenseful, but you've seen the part where yes. he's hiding out in her bedroom. Uh huh. And then she sees her get kind of nude, and he's like sexually observing her, and it's really strange. Like the audience is looking at the woman on film, the same way in the Amazing Panda Adventure. I don't know how many white American kids, when they saw that in theaters, were seen that on home video where. The uh, young girl, uh, Yen, Yen, uh, Ling, when she's uh, in the pool water and they take their clothes off and they leak each other naked and it's like, uh-oh, and some kid gets their first boner. Same way with The Crush. <laughs> they're boner films. Yeah, like they're, they're the kind of films that have that kind of impact on people. And, and what, what else do you want to say about the film? Um... I barely remember The Amazing Panda Adventure, but for The Crush, I barely remember it too, and I would think it looks like some John Carpenter film with some kind of uh, cheesy, like, late 80s tech going on, with the whole, like, but it's this obsession with The Crush, and The Crush becomes the object where Alicia Silverstone, right, is this, like, pretty blonde... Nordic looking Jewish woman and it becomes this kind of uh, thing really where these films, these friendly films more focus on the sexual object itself but I think as for the Amazing Panda Adventure, it doesn't mean that in any way whatsoever and it's more like a, a family film but it's irrational just like how anime and video games have been irrational for white Americans where Let's say you uh, get obsessed with like the Super Nintendo or Final Fantasy and you think Final Fantasy VII is the best video game ever and then you start to learn that the Japanese made that game and then you absorb yourself in Japanese culture. The same way The Amazing Panda Adventure is about uh, someone irrationally absorbing into Chinese culture, even coming from the white perspective of, you know, you might fall in love with the, the cute Chinese girl realize that the panda is something more significant to Chinese society and it irrationally happens and so uh, it's 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 quite funny the amazing panda adventure because the influence is subversive while the influence of the crush is more direct that's how I make the two comparisons uh, venture kid has uh, just uh, joined us uh, venture kid it's a uh, great having you on the show uh, you're welcome 
And uh, Pilliter, you've done a number of interviews with Adventure Kid for your YouTube channel. Yeah, he sounds like a cool guy, especially he knows all about, you know, attack the system and he knows he's kind of the countercurrents uh, aficionado and he sounds like he knows a lot about stuff. Yeah, I talked with Keith Preston earlier today. Mm-hmm. What do you say? Uh, well, we were having a personal conversation. It was interesting. I was, you know, talking about the inauguration with him and what he thought. And I told him I was going to be on the show later on tonight. <laughs> That's cool. How did you meet Keith Preston or talk to him or get in contact? Well, we've been co- corresponding for years on the Internet. And, you know, he gave me his phone number, and I've basically been calling him. Hmm. Adventure Kid, uh, can you tell us about your background and how your kind of views have evolved over time? Uh, you were telling uh, me earlier in a, in a show we did over with uh, Pillator's YouTube channel that you originally started out supporting Obama, and then your views, uh, like a lot of us, have kind of evolved over time. Well, yeah. I mean, I grew up in a solidly Democratic family, you know. I mean, I don't think my family has ever voted for a Republican, ever. And uh, I had pretty liberal views on everything. I, I was even an SJW. And then I started to read, like, countercurrents and alternative rights. You know, uh, I started to watch videos by Gavin McInnes and Joe Rogan and people like that. And I, and I also started to read up on anarchism. I read Peter Lamborn Wilson's book, which were pretty interesting. And uh, also read Artists of the Right by Countercurrents. Yeah, Kerry Bolton. That's I love Kerry. Oh, yeah, he's, he's, been, he's been on, Kerry Bolton's been on the show. Yeah, Kerry Bolton is great. I love his work. He writes a lot about the banking system, and diff- and he's also written some good stuff on different intellectuals like uh, Winham Lewis, uh, Italian futurism, uh, Alistair Crowley. But his main focus seem- is on the whole international uh, financial system. Yeah. You know, Phil Eater, you say you wanted to write a book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's 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 in the production stages. It's it's still. I'm writing. I'm writing a book as Robert's well. Robert's writing a book Robert's too. Writing books. What what are your books going to be about? Robert, do you want to give any spoilers or? I don't want to spoil the plot. I'll just say it's a dark comedy erotic uh, fiction that deals with uh, cultural and and political themes. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, uh, uh, this sounds kind of like a more mature version of Invader Zim. <laughs> uh, I don't know about the Joe and Vasquez influence. I mean, I'd love them to have him on the Stark Truth, Joe. And, uh, he's a very interesting person. I'll just have to send him a message again. Um, um, I would say my own book is going to be more of the avant-garde art zine culture, where the book is more of a, an art piece rather than a, a great American novel. It's probably going to be very pretty to look at at its cover. And then you read the text inside, it might have that kind of um, cut and paste style, but not too out there and experimental. But there is going to be a narrative to it. It it is very um, meaningful. I I will say that it's kind of an Asian American Wes Anderson uh, Tumine style book. That's all I'm going to say at the moment. I know you've done with your videos of uh, Pillator. Uh, Do you share, so you guys share a common interest in anime? Oh, oh yeah, we love anime. I mean, the Adventure Kid—that's a, it's an anime by um, the, the 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 blue girl, right? Oh, I forget his name. Uh, Toshio Maeda. Yeah, Toshio. Okay, Maeda, the gotcha. And um, I barely remember those. Um, those were kind of um, classical '90s stuff. I mean, um, yeah, it's like weird because some of the older anime from the 90s is definitely definitely different from what we know today as anime. Like, what's everybody like today? Attack on Titan and Black Butler. They're kind of like too new and they're very of... Um, well, there's the anime that like kind of stuff you find if you just go on to like a Netflix. Yeah, that's... I mean, that. to be honest, I haven't watched as much anime as uh, you guys but I kind of just, I mean, I, we did a show on uh, Kaze Tukino Uta recently. Oh, have you heard about 
You know, I'm watching something on BET. It's pretty good. What's that? Uh, I said I'm watching the new edition story on BET. <laughs> With Bobby <laughs> Brown? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I'm learning it's stuff I never knew about the band. Do you like uh, uh, New Edition or Bobby Brown? What's your thoughts on them? Sure, why not? Old school R&B, that's great. Yeah, New Jack Swing. Do you remember their uh, song, If It Isn't Love? Oh, what's that called? Um, uh, I know it. You know, um, I'm trying to remember the song. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, telephone man? No, not telephone man. The one where they're like all sweaty and they're in the room and they're like kind of like gay and a homoerotic and it's huh. like they're dancing. Oh, if it isn't love, yeah. If it isn't love. Video. Okay, you know what's funny about that video? Uh, in the beginning, where they had that Jamie Fox look like coach, there's this pretty Korean girl in the the video, right? And then <laughs> I swear in that video, right? <laughs> What happens is there's a love story between Bobby Brown and that Korean woman or something when he dunks his head in that like water and puts his hair and gets the Jamie Foxx coach all wet. And there's that pretty Korean coach girl that's just there. You could say it's an Afro Asian thing, but I don't know. I just think that's funny to point out. That's your kid. Uh, what are your thoughts on Pilliter's whole uh, Asian Aryanism thing? And do you want to start, like, an equivalent of, like, an Afro-Asian uh, movement as, like, a parallel to his? I guess so. You guess so. I thought you were more <laughs> that the anarchist thing. Well, like I said, I don't like to be tied down to one political movement. Like my, like my hero, Bill Kaufman, I don't like being tied to any political movement. Uh, I like to consider myself like a man of multiple movements. Yeah, I can relate to that. The problem, it's kind of like if you put a label on yourself, you get pigeonholed and people take these ideologies like like a religion. Like if you're this label, you have to believe this and this and this instead of looking at each issue on a case by case basis. I mean, we talk about these different kind of ideas in an abstract sense, like the left wing of the alt right or kind of like radical centrism and they're interesting ideas. But if you get pigeonholed too much, and I, I think this has happened with all these different kind of movements like the anar anarchist movement and the alt-right or libertarianism, uh, people get in these movements and uh, maybe the movement has a lot of good ideas, but they feel this obligation because they're part of it. They have to go along with everything the movement stands for and they, they get into this kind of uh, group think where they, they lose their sense of being uh, independent-minded. Yeah, you know, Peel Eater told me you like architecture. You know, there's this book oh, yeah, by definitely. a guy called Peter Mar Maruzzi. It's called Fine Dining. It's a pretty good book. Okay, I I found it. Yeah, it talks a lot about, like, a mid-century modern, and it has these different uh, postcards. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the of uh, mid-century modern architecture and, and uh, design. Yeah, I have this book. It has, like, these beautiful, like, high-contrast photos of, like these mid-century modern restaurants. The, yeah, I see one of uh, Palm Springs, and a lot of these like old up. Uh, a lot of them are old postcards. You, there's a lot of these kind of uh, mid-century modern uh, space age style homes. There's a lot of them in Southern California, and I know I know the blogger Rabbit. He's also really into that aesthetic. Yep. Are you also a fan of like Italian futurism? I think I remember you mentioned it briefly on another show. Yeah, I like it. As far as like so what, uh, architecture uh, styles go, like what are what interests you the most? Well, I'm not really a big architecture fan. I mean, I'm not an architecture nerd, but I guess I like mid-century modern noir. I mean, you know, like Art Deco, surrealism. Oh yeah, I love Art Deco. Uh, surrealism, Dadaism, pop art, optical art, super flat. Well, those aren't architectural movements. Those are just art movements, but I love them. I like Art Nouveau. Yeah. I, yeah, I like all that stuff as well. Art Nouveau, Art Deco, uh, Surrealism, uh, Mid-Century Modern. Kind of basically the era from like the very end of the 19th century to kind of like the up until like the mid-20th uh, century, the 1960s like, to 70s. 
yeah. So, how how did you guys grow up? <laughs> Our political evolutions. Let's see. I've had kind of a similar views that I do now since I was even a teenager, but I kind of went through these phases of exploring different movements. Like I got into libertarianism for a while. I was a Ron Paul supporter in 2008 and 2012. And then I, I got into kind of like a paleo conservative ideas. Uh, like a, I was influenced by like Pat Buchanan and then I discover the new right and sites like a countercurrents. And I guess kind of where we're talking about is kind of this sort of left wing of the alt right, which is, I guess if I want to be really specific, that's kind of the people I identify the most with. But if I'm talking to someone who is more, more mainstream or even someone who is politically interesting, but doesn't know like the finer details I might describe myself as like a radical centrist and radical centrism just means that you're like a anti-establishment, but have a sort of a mixture of a, like a views that come from the left and the right. Yeah. Well, I consider myself a lot of things. I'm a red Tory, a socially conservative socialist, um, a loco foco, a Jeffersonian and a Christian anarchist. Yeah, that's the one thing you were you were saying because um, if you were to ever establish some Afro Asian Arianism, <laughs> for lack of a better term, then obviously uh, you would have to work on that. Because I remember you telling me you are divided between Hispanic women and Asian women. You are more on the Hispanic leaning side. Well, who wouldn't be? I mean, you got big asses. Who can't resist it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I think I dated. I dated one Hispanic girl in college, and she was real nice. But um, I can I can totally understand. Um, maybe. I mean, let's be honest. Asian women aren't really known for being curvaceous, unless we're talking about like South Asian. Oh, like Indian. What What do you think from What do you think about like the Gongaroo girls? Do you like that type? The Gadu, like the dark skinned blonde haired Asian prostitutes. Yeah, I think they're pretty hot. Oh, like Gangaru. Yep. Take a wild guess what I like. Israeli Aryanism and blonde Nordic <laughs> Jewish looking women, which are very pretty too, I have to say. They're very rare. And hey, pretty. have you told them that I once called Nina Hartley? So they were hilarious. You tell me that story. I barely know about your calling. You told me you once called Nina and tried to. What was that like? Well, it was. It, that's not really a story. I tried to call her, her agent. You know, see it something or something or other, and she hung up, and that was it. I thought it would be her, but it was just her agent. Oh, so you more like you call his agent, her agent. Yeah, it would have been cool if I could call her myself. I mean, it, Nina Holly is like a hot Jewish female. <laughs> well, maybe you should call again. And She's one of the time. few white girls with a big butt. <laughs> I, I don't think I've seen any films with Nina in it or know about really of them. Um, I, there's this one porn actress that's in my Twitter feed a lot. Her name's Mia Calf, and she has like she's known. She's dark skinned She's got really big tits at the moment, and people. I mean, Mia Khalifa. Yeah, yeah, that's her name, and people. Oh call yeah, her. she Mia Khalifa. I think she's Lebanese. Okay, and um, that people like her because she just has big tits or something. I haven't never seen a film with her in there, but yeah, she's being talked a lot, a lot at the current moment. Well, there's this, there's this one Asian chick who's a porn star that I like. She's from she's Pakistani. Her name is Nadia Ali. She has a nice she has a nice butt and some nice real curves. I like uh, Bailey Lee. She's like a Dominican Republican. She's she's really funny. She'll like insult her men when she's like in a Bang Bros video. She'd be like, she'll be getting tipped. Oh, like saying they have like small dicks. She'd be like, hurry up, you fucking dumbass! You're sweating all <laughs> over me. And I'm like laughing so hard like it's it's cute though it's like a mean girl cute there's this other indian porn actress named prior ray she's like oh she's all about like gagging noises and being like laughing and like oh there's this there's a whole comp blooper compilation of it online one of these extra since, since we're kind of on the por issue of like a porn and like social conservatism so kind of where i'm coming from 
is in in some ways like I can be kind of I'm interested in things like erotica and this like avant garde erotic art yeah. and a lot of way, things that would get me classified as like a degenerate. Yes. But at the same time, I can kind of understand like social conservatism because it, it can kind of provide like a sense of stability for society. I think this kind of radical individual liberalism has led to a lot of people becoming more uh, socially atomized and a lot of uh, dis- dysfunctional problems that you hear uh, traditionalist and conservative talks about, talk about like a sing- single motherhood. And I think there are, are people delaying marriage until they're well into their thirties. So I kind of, I can kind of understand kind of this. I can kind of like understand both sides as far as like social uh, conservatism and this kind of liberal individualism, and you have and Pil- uh, Pilliter, would you? S- you're kind of, I guess I'll ask both you guys this, but Pilliter, I, th- I get the sense you kind of come from the same direction because on the show you talk about your Christian background, but then you talk about all this kind of like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? It's, it's you it's, talk about all your like uh, Asian porn and yeah. a Yowie. Yowie uh, that's anime. why I always stress, though, I'm definitely, I told this to Adventure Kid, I definitely came from somewhat of a troubled background, but at least um, I survived that whole avant-garde, inner-city, liberal punk scene, you know. I wouldn't even call it punk, I would just call it, like, avant-garde queerness, right? And at the age of, like, 14, 15, you're being exposed to all this at once, and, like, when I was, like, 15, 14, 15, I was a chiptune musician, and I played Game Boy music, because that was hip, and I was getting so much attraction because, you know, if you're young, everybody wants you, right? It's this weird virgin thing. You know, on a date site, everybody wants you when you're 17, 18, right? And uh, everyone goes after you and uh, you get it ex- quickly. Are you talking about in gay culture? Gay culture and in straight culture. Like if you're after a 17-year-old virgin woman, it's it's the same. Like everybody wants to talk to you if you're like 17, 16 or young and you're too young to understand the world. And I was like that being like a chip team musician and everybody thought I was the cool kid and all that stuff. And then it's like learning about like at the same time like this countercurrent and like White House – and getting into like very weird reading strange fiction like we just said bizarro fiction and like knowing about obscure i was you know i didn't refine my taste into the classics and like uh, asian literature until i was in college and um that was like a few because because when you're at the young age of uh 17 you're 16 all you want to do is be in a band hang out with cool kids and just uh know things like an autistic person and like with Asperger's you just repeat these things like a parrot now I kind of know foundationally about these things I wish more normies would be know about the things I've went through and with the whole Christian background right um with with the whole Christian background I would say that I kind of repented myself when I did bad things and I think Christianity is a good identity to have is because you can be forgiven for the so things. So you have to like re- do you repent every time after we do a show where we talk about degenerate <laughs> stuff. Well, you you could say that. I mean, I don't go in my bed and be like, "Oh dear God, what I just." No, I'm not. I'm an honest person, right? I'll pray to God and say, you know, hopefully these things will happen. Everyone will get together. Everyone will get. You know, I'm very of a, an optimistic person. I think having a a supernatural belief in this. I mean, not to sound like a new age hippie or something, but at least being this cool, you know, stuff white people like Christian puts common sense to things. I always know that the God and Bible is always right, but not in this weird, um, I know in the alt-right there's this orthodox trad youth Christian thing where it's like, oh, Christianity is, that's where everything's at. I mean, that's cool too, but I'm not coming from this like weird, I'm coming from this like hipster Christian background, I guess. Uh, Adventure Kid, what do you, what is your, do you have a religious background or are you more on the political religious side where politics and ideology becomes your religion or do you have some spiritual basis? I have a real religion. I'm a Christian. <laughs> Interesting. How much does the Christian, you know, play part in your politics of understanding nationalism or socialism? Well, I'm more of a moderate. I mean, I am pro-life, but. At the same time, I'm okay with weed being legalized. 
Yeah, that's the thing about like being Christian. I feel like there's this whole you could do I don't know whatever to call it hipster Christianism where it's like you could do all these cool stuff that's so like unorthodox to being like it sounds anti-establishment. And then at the end of the day, you like you repent your sins and then you're you strive to be a good strong person or something. And um it's an interesting theory and I think that's totally what it is dominant today. Compared to, like, if you were this really radical Orthodox or even, like, Pentecostal, I think, like, there's some, talking about porn, there are some porn actresses that will literally have, like, you know, they'll have Christ crosses for necklaces, right? Yeah, funny you mention that, because I've heard these, like, uh, anti-Semitic white nationalists say that, like, Jewish pornographers will put that in there to, like, disrespect Christianity. Yeah, that that's interesting you say that. I look at it in the light where it's, like... Okay, what if they are hardcore Christians? They do that, then they repent later, and they're creating this new Christian synergy. Uh, right? Hey, can I say something? Yeah, what's that? Have you guys heard of Fly Down the Records? No. Oh uh, no. Uh, well, Fly Down the Records were like this record label in the '80s that put out like alternative rock, you know, in New Zealand. My favorite band was the Verlaines, and they made this song called "Death and the Maiden." Um. Death in the Maiden? The songs? Yeah. Okay, and the, the band was... Yeah. Uh, the Verlaine. The Verlaines, because the music is interesting. Uh, I have not heard of that, but... Okay, the Verlaines. Okay, I've not heard of them, but that's 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 that's, that's interesting. That is... Uh, it's, a, it's like classic rock from 1982. I can't really... Yeah. Interesting. I mean, do you like what? What are your thoughts on like some of the '90s, like grunge rock or emo rock? Well, I like Kurt Cobain. I mean, I think grunge kind of played itself out like Pump did a generation earlier. Do you like uh, Placebo? Not. I heard of them, but I haven't heard of their music. Uh, yeah, I was a. Huge placebo fan. I, I see placebo's influences creeping through the mid '90s emo stuff, even though they're kind of mainstream now, and they're they've been mainstream for a long time. But even though they're kind of forgotten today, I still think placebo does have this kind of interesting influence. I think Richard Spencer even likes placebo. When Radix Journal was uh, launched, he had an article about placebo's Meds album, and then it was quickly taken down along with the David Lynch thing. And I wonder where that has been since. And you can make an, a claim. Oh, what, did, what did Richard Spencer have to say about David Lynch? That's interesting. Yeah, those articles were just deleted. This was after the purging of AlternativeRight.com. Radix appeared, and there were two articles. It was something about David Lynch, and then something about Placebo's Meds album by Richard Spencer. I do remember we were kind of talking about Richard Spencer, that in some ways he kind of has these kind of elements of like the left wing of the alt right, yeah. but I think his website uh, has to kind of cater more to like uh, the a right wing audience. Like he tailors it to a right wing audience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, uh... but I did a show about with him a while back, yeah. and he 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 talks a lot about his ideas. Like economically, he supports some form of a social safety net. I don't think he's really like a hardcore social conservative. I mean, in that one yeah. interview. Oh, sorry. What's that? Uh, I said, yeah. In that one interview he did with The Atlantic, Richard Spencer said, you know, I always wanted to be in theater and be an avant garde director. And I was like, hmm, is the alt right and alternative right a, a continuation of his avant garde career? Well, when I interviewed uh, Richard Wollstonecraft, uh, his theory was that the alt right kind of had its origins in these like avant garde individuals, uh, yes. like uh, Jim Goad, uh, Adam Parfrey, and Boyd Rice, Trevor Brown, Peter Sotos, William Bennett of White House. Well, I think you can even go back further than that because there's also these roots in like you know uh, the German conservative revolutionary movement, the yeah. nonconformists of the 1920s and 30s, the uh, the populists of the 1800s, the futurists of the 1900s. Ernst Younger, you're right. What do you think about, uh, there's Winham Lewis, are you familiar with him? Oh, I've heard of Winham Lewis. You know, 
I read like a profile on him and like the artist of the right. I have a funny story. Was, I was reading the, um, I have the book, The Art of Being Ruled. Uh, I was reading it at my college and it was my birthday. And my girlfriend said, no, I can't go over to your house. I got to help pack with my parents. So I go to China and I was just reading it alone in the library and reading this huge um, criticism about the the nature of uh, European women and how they're scatterbrained or something. And I, I, I liked it so much that uh, I think a few months later after reading it and it's entire, you know, I, I bought, I found a copy on the eBay for like 10 or $20. The book is really expensive, but it's the Black Sparrow Press edition, which I really love. The same edition Jonathan Bowden sources. What's interesting about kind of the argument that Winham Lewis and uh, Alistair Crowley made Made, is there are kind of individuals they kind of existed they they rejected sort of uh, modern liberalism but they weren't uh, reactionaries or radical traditionalists either but there's sort of these different schools of thought there's the sort of there's like the distributist and like the early uh, 19th century early 20th century populist and uh, people like William Jennings Bryan they made the argument that like uh, commerce was suppressing traditional values and uh, family life. And then Winham Lewis and Alistair Crowley made the case that you have like these kind of uh, genuine cultural elitism and aristocratic uh, individualism. And uh, these are in that capitalism kind of suppresses like genuine cultural elites, because if you look at the people who become like the, Richest in society, there are people like uh, Walt, people who uh, own Walmart. Well, let me say something about the populace. You know, from reading Dale Kaufman, and you should really check out this guy's books because he's great. I learned a lot about uh, how the populace, you know, did a lot to advance freedom and to make sure the poor weren't forgotten. You know, I learned about not just the famous names like William Jennings Bryan, but also people who weren't famous like. Socialist Jerry Simpson, um, Hamlin Garland, um, Gerald Nye, William Bora. And that's also very significant today because uh, populism has become kind of neglected. It's always been conservatism versus liberalism. And I think you've had a, you had a few figures more recently you've touched on that. People like uh, Ross Perot, uh, Pat, uh, Pat Buchanan. And even some people on the left, like uh, Ralph Nader and even uh, Bernie Sanders, and well, Jerry with, Brown. Yeah, I think. But I think what's remarkable about Trump is, I, I mean, I obviously have a lot of issues with Trump. Like, I don't like a lot of his cabinet appointments. But it's remarkable that he was able to get elected on a like populist message, and I think that is changing the political dichotomy where populism is being entered into the mainstream and. Uh, people are talking about populism as opposed to just like liberalism and conservatism. Oh, oh yeah, you you got a point. Um, oh yeah, I got a. I thought about something. You know, a way we could deal with the immigration problem is that we could just increase automation. <laughs> sure. Oh yeah, Anat Anatoly Carlin. Uh, made that point. Pilly, remember that? Yes, yes. I was thinking about that of immigration. Explain more about how that would be implemented, though. Kind of, I'm not so aware of these big economic questions, but. Well, I think it's a great idea. It just depends, like, who the profits of automation. So we're bringing in all this, like, uh, cheap labor to do these uh, jobs, like, in agriculture and fast food. And if that revenue goes, if that revenue generated from the profits is a reimbursed to the people, that would be a great thing because you can make the case that uh, subsidizing like illegal immigrants who work in agriculture, I mean, you can make a case that's a form of corporate welfare, but automation could be if it's done the right way and the profits go to the public as opposed to like the corporations looting the profits. But I, that's an issue that I'm very fascinated with. Adventure Kid, do you want to expand on that? You mean expand on the automation? Uh, we could do like, um, I don't know what this science fiction stuff I was watching. We could do like Angel Cop. 
we could just have like the robots do all do all the hard work while we could do like the easy work. <laughs> sounds very science fiction. Probably that sounds like oh, the Matrix well, hey. thing. Oh yeah, you know Robert Stark. I don't know, but you know me and Rabbit were talking about how politically incorrect Japan is one time, and we were <laughs> talking about this infamous anime from like the eighties called Angel Cop. You know where it was basically advocating for fascism. You were, uh, I think I remember Angel Cop, um, but I don't. I never really watched it entire, but I've seen it. Oh, yeah, you know what's funny? Angel Cop has is known for the. You've ever heard of the 15ing era? There was this thing in the 90s where anime as the genre was kind of used for like juvenile hardcore punk like there was a there was this anime called Cyber City Oda 808 or something and it was basically like they would go they would just swear in every sentence and the the famous line by the white hair guy was you wouldn't recognize a goddamn vampire if it came up and bit you on the fucking dick. And I think Angel Cop Yeah, um, you know has like, you know, Angel Cop has some ridiculous sentences, too. Like, he says, if this is justice, then I'm a banana. I was like, what the fuck does that even mean? Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, some of the English dub for Angel Cop, I remember, was just, like, joking, like, ah, fuck, shit, damn it, and just blood and gore, right? And to me, this is, like, a strange definition of, uh, anime if it was all just blood and gore and swearing and just radical that was really popular in the 90s today anime means a high school drama it's all about me me selfish trying to give your perfect japanese girlfriend uh you still got stuff like drifters and you know attack on titan and stuff that is really dark i mean drifters are just bleak that was kind of my image of anime i mean i was aware of anime since i was a uh kid in like the late 90s just something that's kind of silly but then i've been like discovering all this stuff uh via i mean i didn't really follow anime until i met you pillator it's funny because in the 90s they called it japanimation and it was on vhs tapes the company manga entertainment solely published anime for sheer shock value funny funny is that atari teenage riot on their greatest hits album on their broken rolling tr909 drum machine puts on manga entertainment stickers all over atari teenage riot was in love with that 15ing anime scene where japanese for shock art anarchy state now today it just means like pretty cutesy girls oh i wish my life was like this and so the western translation of anime means like this uh it's always changing. It's been changing for the past 30, 40 years. And so this isn't, this is actually a fa- facade understanding about Japanese culture. Hopefully. And I think that the aesthetics have changed as well. Uh, a lot of the older animes and mangas that we've looked at, like Padaliro and Kase Tuni Kouta, they, they're very beautiful uh, illustrations, aesthetics, yes. but the newer ones are very. A uh, very synthetic. They're yes. very like generic uh, cartoons. Exactly, and they just produce from this typical style, like of Attack on Titan, and just um, get it out there. One of my friends, I was having a discussion, saying, "You know, I think Attack on Titan might be Asian Aryan simply on the fact that they come from the future and they all have German Japanese backgrounds." And like, you know, I've only seen two episodes of Attack on Titan, and it could be plausible for an Asian Aryan society. But um, <laughs> that's a that's a digression. But um, the point is that a lot of these new animes seem to be guttering from this. The, you see it. It's this typical. T- it's 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 not the, about the traditional Japanese art. Tra- Japanese compare that to like um, Padalio. It's different. It, it it's people get the normies get shocked. Right. They have to have this 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 cat. You know this normie anime. To they have to have anime for normies. And traditional animes for the authentic Japanese, it's its a tough issue. And I think the right and animes... Also, it's a shift in age. The original anime was more adult-oriented. Today, the anime they're creating is uh, geared all, towards the children. All ages, every single person, depending yeah, exactly. on... Uh, Adventure is- Kid, uh, you were talking about... We've talked about kind of things like the alt-left. Uh, can you talk about some of the issues where you agree more with the left than you do with the right? Oh uh, well, yeah. Like I said, like I said last time, you know, environmentalism, legalizing of marijuana, universal health care. 
Yeah, I agree with all those issues. Uh, can you talk about those issues like environmentalism, uh, legalized, legalized uh, marijuana, and uh, health care in more detail? Well, you know, like, we, weed, my thing is this. You know, I think it's stupid that we're putting people, kids in prison with murders and rapists for smoking a small amount of weed. It's just ridiculous. I mean, it's just idiocracy. And weed was legal in America until 1937. And they made, like, this big, stupid campaign to say, like, reefer madness and all that, that weed was bad for you and it make you go crazy and kill people. And they printed these false facts, like, you know, that it's a gateway drug and all that other nonsensical bullshit. I mean, the LaGuardia report is earliest, the 40s, said that all that was nonsense, yet the government still ignored it and pursued a war on drugs, even though that was all bullshit. And what are your uh, thoughts on environmentalism, and what, based on your observations, what do you see as some of the most crucial uh, ecological issues? Well, I think we should reduce, you know, gas, and you know, I stand with standing rocks, you know, I think it's ridiculous that Trump signed the thing that says he wants to go through there and build this Keystone Pipeline, which I think is fucking ridiculous. And I think we need to we need to get global warming under control, man. I got a magazine from like Earth First, you know, like that. Yeah, I got a magazine of Earth First. I mean, it's not like I'm some hippie or something. I just want environmentalism, you know, protect our uh, national parks, our, our endangered species, our waterways. You know, I think what happened in Flint, Michigan was a fucking tragedy. You had that asshole Rick, Rick Snyder, you know, who poisoned his own people and tried to make excuses for it. And that's kind of the problem is with politics is like people need to put together the best ideas. It's like you're either you either have to be like this Republican type who is uh, anti-environment, denies global warming, uh, supports the war on drugs, or you have to be uh, this uh, liberal who's like an SJW or open borders. Like people can't just put the most sensible ideas together, and uh, that, that I don't I don't really get. I mean, some people people like us uh, get this, but for most people, it's just it goes back to what I said at the beginning of the show. They get into these boxes and they put together these ideas. Uh, Venture Kid, you did mention that you voted for Trump on a previous show. Was it primarily the issues of uh, immigration and trade? And what are your thoughts well, on yeah. Trump's performance so far? Trump's performance? Well, he says he's still going to build the wall. Although he, the country, the America is going to do it. Obviously not Mexico. And, no, that was just yeah. yeah that was just I the like what I see so far on trade. You know, he the TPP is dead. I mean, to call the TPP a trade deal would be a fucking disgrace. I mean, it wasn't a trade deal. If you actually, I mean, it was a form of protectionism. You know, protecting IP law. You know, I'm just learning about trade myself, so I can't really get too deep in that. But I think Kevin Carson wrote like a great article on Center for Stateless Society about how the TPP wasn't really free trade. It was basically just giving the companies, it was basically just a form of crony capitalism, protecting the companies from any com competition whatsoever. What are your thoughts on uh, Trump's uh, uh, cabinet uh, choices? Well, I mean. Uh, it's a mixed bag. I mean, he got a dude who sold cheeseburgers to be his labor secretary, so that's fucking ridiculous. But he also got, um, I guess Rex Tillerson isn't so bad, although I don't like his Russia baiting. And, you know, Jeff Sessions, as attorney general, is probably going to do a lot about immigration. I mean, he's totally uncooked. So he's going to he's gonna come down hard on immigration. Um, crap. What do you think about his uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, uh, Mnuchin, who's from Goldman Sachs? Uh, I did not like that. And Mnuchin, he really doesn't seem to be that political. He was a Democrat formerly, but he also gave it to Republicans, so it's hard to say what Mnuchin is going to do. 
And I hate Goldman Sachs. I mean, I'm a old, I'm a populist dude. Populists t- typically don't like big banks or big corporations. Have you studied like different like alternative banking ideas? Like there's like public banking and a social credit. I know uh, Kerry Bolden's written a lot about that topic. Not not really, but um, uh, I guess my vision of a perfect banking system would be like kind of a decentralized banking system. I know Trump did talk about reinstating Glass-Steagall, but it's hard to say whether he'll do that because uh, the Republican Congress is not going to go along with that. Yeah, they probably won't. I mean, the Republicans today have they've just completely lost their tradition. I mean, it wasn't nothing but 50 years ago that Republicans used to stand up for the little man. Now all they care about is getting money from Goldman Sachs. I mean, the Republicans have lost their way. I mean, if Robert, Robert La Follette was still alive, he would probably curse them out. Robert La Follette was like this socialist Republican who did a lot to help the poor in Wisconsin. Do you think like a basic uh, income will be necessary in the future with uh, automation and globalization? Well, it probably will have to. I mean, um, with automation going on, the factory jobs and the textile jobs and the farm farm jobs are probably going to be lost. So you're going to have to give people a basic income. I mean, you just can't let them starve on the street. I mean, after all, nobody wants to live it, live in the future of Judge Dredd or like RoboCop where there's like robo, robots everywhere and you have people starving in these mega cities. I don't want to live in Judge, Judge Dredd. Do you? Nah. One th- other thing about uh, Trump is he made that comment in his speech about America first and people made comparisons to the America First movement in World War II trying to say as a fascist movement. I know you said you were a fan of Bill uh, Kaufman, and uh, he's ri- Bill Kaufman's written a book about the America First movement. Yeah, I am a big fan. I got like three of Bill Kaufman's books. I even talked to him a couple of times. And you know, Bill Kaufman, he's like an interesting guy. He's not really ideological. I mean, if you look up his Wikipedia page and Look under like politics. Um, you'll find that he's a lot of things. You should really look up his Wikipedia page because it's very interesting. You know, he got a lot of stuff about him. Oh, he yeah, he's an interesting a person. He also corresponded with uh, Gore Vidal, who's also someone I'm, I'm someone I admire. Uh, Kaufman is sort of interested in ideas. He is like a distributism and a lot of different uh, kind of populist ideas. Uh, he's voted for like both Pat Buchanan and Ralph Nader. And it's interesting about Pat Buchanan and Ralph Nader is like people will say uh, Pat Buchanan's a right winger and Ralph Nader is a left winger. But in a lot of ways, uh, they had this they they set up this debate and it ended up like they found out like they ended up agreeing like uh, most of the time, except for a few of like the social issues. On the core issues, uh, Ralph Nader and Pat Buchanan uh, are pretty much on the same page on a lot of the crucial issues. Yeah. Hey, Robert Stark, you know, um, what, what, what would be your perfect vision for the perfect woman? <laughs> a little off topic. I mean, we always talk about women. and <laughs> Everyone has desires, but there's no... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I can't really say I love to because I don't know my own desires, so... Yeah, yeah. Because we're talking about women again, earlier on we were talking about pornography. I, I want to put in something interesting about that whole avant-garde thing about, you know, pornographers and how it's an interesting culture. You know, we could be talking about our favorite porn actresses or even porn actors like Dick's mother, Jr. or Peter North. It's interesting to note that there's somewhat of an alt-porn movement going on or alternative pornography, right? You think alt-right and alt-left is a thing? Well, there's also alt-porn. Oh, yeah. I see the one you sent me. And um, there's a Wikipedia page, too. There's this guy. I loved his films, Eon McKay. Um, he's kind of this avant-garde um, director who will get these weird white girls or something. Rabbit might like this. And then in, he makes <laughs> these films, which are not the traditional erotic sense with the, you know, 
tit fucking or whatever, but rather oh, it's, it's like, about. Uh, I've heard of this awesome. like suicide girls. It's like uh, tat- a lot of tattoos and piercings. Well, it, you could say that. I mean, tattoos are like I'm not so much. The t- I like cute tattoos, right? Um, like I like so, cute tattoos uh, with families on I them guess... and whatever. But the so thing Adventure is, Kid was asking me what I like. I mean, I'm a big fan of Emily Bloom. <laughs> we have to get her on the show eventually. Hey, um, can I say something about, you know, the art? My yeah, favorite sure. filmmakers are like the weird ones. I like people like Alejandro Jordawaski, John Waters, Hermity Corinne. I like their weird movies. Yes. You know, Alejandro oh, Jordawaski, we've done, his movies. Yeah, we've done... A lot of shows on like avant garde films. Hordorowski and his, uh, you know, The Magic Mountain and, you know, his Dune, his version of Dune, if he would have published that film, it would have changed our perception. I thought uh, David Lynch did the film, Dune. Yes, yes. He, David Lynch took it over and put a Lynchian view on how we think about Dune. However, if Hordorowski was to make Dune, we would have this weird psychedelic drug version, right? And now we're stuck with the Lynch version. And that's all that, that one little thing, if in history. I mean, take a look at Horowski's other films. Very experimental out there. He has his own style that's very uh, important. I love, I remember seeing that uh, documentary in theaters uh, when he was doing about Dune. It's super interesting. I love the soundtrack, by the way. I have that on vinyl. Really good synth soundtrack. But um, there's, there's also this film by uh, Gaspar No. Uh, I forget the name off the top of my head, but it's about Japan. Oh. Is it called um, I Stand Alone? Oh, Gaspar No has this film called uh, Enter the Void, and it f- kind of fuses the themes of uh, LSD, DMT, and the imagery of Japan. So you have all the cool like a uh, neon uh, lighting of, of Japan fused with like the hallucina- j- hallucinations uh, from uh, LSD and DMT. And uh, that I mean that's a film I'd recommend. I'm a big fan of uh, Gaspar No. Have you seen his work? Who, me? Yeah. No, I haven't. But, um, let's see. I have seen Video Drone by David Cronenberg. That was a trippy movie. You know, Gaspar No, um, I want to see that film. He was influenced by Peter Sotos and his own love. And that's been... Oh, he's a personal friend of Peter Sotos. Yeah, and, uh, we should definitely get him on the show, too, be a nose. And so, uh... But Gaspar Noe's films are interesting because they touch upon very avant-garde things, and he's definitely taking it to a different direction, including an architect and sexual avant-garde stuff that might be considered alt-porn. Yeah, you know, I think we should make our own avant-garde movie one day, like a three-hour movie. I'm writing a book, and I want my book made into an avant-garde film, but hopefully someone will pick it up, but I'm still in the... I mean, the writing process is almost complete. I just have to, like, kind of finish up the editing. Yeah, you know, the thing about avant-garde stuff, you know, like Eon Flux, is that sometimes it doesn't make any sense. Like, even Peter Chung, when he made Eon Flux, he said that he isn't completely sure what he was doing. And he just kind of made it up as he went along. So, Adventure Kid, you mentioned you're a uh, fan of sites like uh, Countercurrents and like the alt right, and they deal a lot with uh, white identity. And I mean, you're you're black, and I noticed with you have kind of a b- black conservatives who are like assimilationist, and they in the sense that they talk about assimilating into like uh, quote unquote white culture. And then you have like black national anarchism and people who admire uh, Marcus uh, Garvey and those thinkers. Uh, out of those, do you identify with one of those groups? Like, can you kind of talk about your relationship between uh, being being black and following uh, sites like Countercurrents that are focused on a uh, like white identity and white nationalism? Well, I think um, like both. Let me just put this, make this very clear. Even though I like countercurrents, I am not a racist at all. I mean, I, I want the white people to, like, have their own homeland. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I, But, you know, I'm not a racist. And sometimes when I read the racist stuff on countercurrents, it can get irritating sometimes. Hmm. Like which pieces? Well, it's like, my thing is this. There's nothing wrong with being proud of your race, but do you really have to put down other people when you're talking? 
like sometimes people like Greg Johnson will just little black people over and over again and try to make it seem like all white people are superior to everybody else. It's like, come on, dude. You could have made a speech about being white without damn belittling other people. It's like, why do you have to do that every time? So the ideal I mean, that... I know black... Cr- Go ahead. Uh, I mean, I know black crime is like a serious problem, but but every time you make a speech, you don't have to say nigger this and nigger that, you know, when you're talking about white identity. Yeah, I That's mean... That's the reason I like to like Robert... L- that's why I like Robert Lindsay and his liberal race realism, because he's a realist about race, but he's not a racist. I mean, where I'm coming from is uh, I am pretty much view Petri people as individuals, and I pretty much agree with you, but I do think that uh, demographics are a crucial uh, issue because I think I think it's also rational that like uh, white people don't don't want to be – don't want to become a minority, and I think yeah, it's rational. I understand rational that. To, you know, yeah. I understand all that. But I, I totally uh, get what you're saying about a lot of the like rhetoric, and you're, you're saying like the racial slurs or derogatory comments. Yeah, like that's really irritating. And then you have like these stuff, like the right stuff will make like these jokes about you know committing genocide against black people or committing genocide against the Jews putting people in ovens, you know, saying they want to, then there's comments where they say, you want to shoot every black person ever. It's like, whoa, dude. Like, that's crazy. I agree with you on white nationalism, but you're, you're going too far. I know what you're saying. Uh, exactly. That's why I always was turned off by the right stuff was I thought it was this juvenile trolling or they call it shit posting. And it's just, it's content, but it's too, I don't know. It's too like, it's just whatever it's countercurrents has a more professional level. And, um, you can understand from any aspect. Pillar, do you kind of find the same experience from from your background? Well, um, that's always been a problem when you're talking about race realism. It's this ideal of supremacy, right? There's one race, it's better, and then area there's a hierarchy of races. So if there's this ideal that in white nationalism, whites are the supreme race and everything is below you, that you know it says that black people are obviously mutts and they do this. You know, it assumes that Asians are bug-like people and not emulate, you know, and then whites are the supreme creative innovators. That, that is a current trend if you believe that. I, I do think you have to look out for that because it definitely has this very uh, selfish ideal about, like you just said, you, you should treat people as individuals. And if you were to believe in freedom of association, you definitely would consider that, consider those things. But however, um, it shouldn't be this, uh, I guess the liberals will say it's stereotyping. However, it is definitely, if you were to make effective white nationalism to happen, it should definitely not fall into that whole uh, Hollywood Nazism, you know, that the liberal media yeah, well, tends to You know, I agree with you, because if you were a complete white nationalist about everything, you wouldn't be able to live your life. I mean, there were black inventors and Jewish inventors, so if you're a complete white nationalist, you're not going to use Jewish inventions or black inventions <laughs> because you're a white nationalist. I've even heard white nationalists say that they don't believe in Jewish math. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Jewish math? Algebra? You don't believe in math because you're a white nationalist? That's fucking stupid. It's more like culturally appropriating. I mean, it's more like they'll just culturally appropriate things and then put it in their own light. But uh, I know what you're saying, too. You, you can't imagine everything entirely, and you can only have... Uh, yeah, that's interesting to think about. And if you look at like white nationalism, uh, there's actually an interesting book. There's a uh, black conservative woman named Carol Swan who wrote a book about white nationalism, and... She rejects white nationalism. She's more like a civic. She advocates like a colorblind civic nationalism. But her book is fairly fair and nuanced, and she goes over the large scope. So in one uh, extreme, you have like uh, people who are like uh, who advocate genocide on one extreme. Then you have like a separatist who advocate carving out like a racially pure ethno state. Then the most moderate wing of like white nationalism would be people who say, like, let's just have a moratorium on uh, third world immigration and institute freedom of association. Uh, Venture Kid, like, what are your thoughts on, like, the most moderate wing that uh, takes that position? I guess Jared Taylor is kind of that way. 
And I mean, Pat Buchanan uh, wouldn't describe himself as a white nationalist, but he kind of fits into there as well. Well, I also think Gavin McKinney and Jim Gold are also part of that, too. Although Gavin McKinney and Jim Gold are more mainstream than Taylor is. <laughs> that's, that's, that's interesting you make that comparison to say that if... I know what you're saying, mainstream as in popular, culturally accepted, but I would think Jared Taylor would be more of a, a, a elite establishment and having more cultural power because of his influences in certain realms, while Jim and Gavin are more of the, uh, in a, a certain niche community. Yeah, you know, you, you got a point about that, because Gavin McGinnis, it's hard to say where politically he is. The same goes for Jim Goad. I, I haven't been able to figure out whether Gavin or Jim are like left wing or right wing. Jim said he was a skeptic, and he basically is his own person. If you get in his way, he'll beat you up. That's basically Jim's philosophy. And Gavin yeah. is that He's, same tradition, I, I think. Jim Goad has this kind of more of an individualistic, uh, misanthropic streak to him that I sense. Yeah, well, what, 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 James, what is James J. O'Mara like? Because I wanted to ask Robert Stark what he's like. I really don't know. He's a white nationalist. He's a homo. He, he's a homosexual. He has this whole theory called the homo and the Negro. And I mean, the premise of it is anti-black, but it's uh, different than like your stereotypical. It's kind of these a lot of esoteric ideas. But what he uses is like the quote unquote Negro to describe kind of like white masculinity and like the ideal like things like maybe like bro culture or even redneck culture. And then he talks about this sort of uh, aristocratic ideal, which he says has a ends from like the homo and the men are boon. So he has his own kind of esoteric ideas. That's like my best explanation. But I mean, I would suggest uh, asking him uh, personally to kind of explain his ideas. I'm wondering if the homo... And he's, and- he's pretty, he's fairly eccentric. I would hopefully the homo and negro philosophy falls under the poem in the wind of trees anime. <laughs> yeah. Or you were, what were we joking about on our last show about all these, like, what is, like, the ideal society for these uh, homosexual white nationalists? That's what I'm saying, like, this manner bone thing, right? And you gotta, it might be Lassie Nielsen films or Poem of the Wind Trees for the Asian Aryan. Oh, we, I would say that Fargo would be, like, the perfect society. Fargo? Oh, the film Fargo? <laughs> I said Sparta. You know, Sparta. Sparta. Oh, Sparta. <laughs> I was going to say. Sparta, that's interesting. Well, you know, Thebes, like the Thebes, like there was this uh, arm, There was this group called the Theban Sacred Band, and they were like these homosexual warriors who actually fought, well, fought with the Spartans a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that the Spartans, they died young in their mid, mid or late 20s, and uh, their history was written down saying that... Um, you know, this is what they did. And if they were lucky and survived war, they would have arranged marriages and marry at 30 and have children. And kind of this interesting, but yeah, there was a lot of men on men action in the Spartan society compared to the Deccan Athenians who would just lay around and just eat and drink and not even write history. The Spartans wrote history. The Athenians were lazy, but they had all these intellectual stuff. And yet, it, you know, it is interesting Spartan society, but right now we can't live in a naked society and do this we're in uh we're this weird society now where we have a lot of stuff we're at the end of the show adventure kid i'll ask you one last question describe your ideal utopian society both aesthetically uh culturally and politically batman the animated series <laughs> oh, awesome <laughs> well with paul denny and bruce tim yeah that's that's it's pretty interesting um can you explain more on that or yeah, because, you know, I mean, it's a beautiful society. It's stuck somewhere in possibly between the 30s and the 70s. It has, like, beautiful Art Deco city, beautiful women. You know, it's possibly it's a beautiful northern city, lots of super science. And I think it could possibly be an Asian Aryan utopia because the... the the city was inspired by Japanese aesthetics a little bit. I really love this stuff. It's like uh, all these illustrations of these kind of cool, like uh, Art Deco uh, skyscrapers that you see in New York. 
it's most the show's most famous for the introduction of uh, Harley Quinn and um, her background on that and that very strange um, Venture Brothers nineteen sixties like you just said Venture Kid this this interesting space age aesthetic to it with this grim dark to this. It's definitely influenced also by like the film Metropolis, mm-hmm. and it's very uh, film noir. Yes. Batman the Animated Series was very influential. I mean, it inspired a lot of cartoons. You know, it's dark and gritty attitude, you know, is what made it stand out. Like, for example, in one episode, somebody got shot and there was actual blood. You know, there were strippers in another episode, which was weird because it was a kid's cartoon, which I find hilarious. And Batman busted down a crack house in another episode, so it was very mature. And I'm surprised that it wasn't really censored. I kind of, uh, like, we were talking about Akira and uh, the whole, and then the whole kind of a cyberpunk genre. I think in a lot of ways, like, cyberpunk is an extension of the film noir genre. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, film noir goes back to the 30s, and, uh, I mean, the film, a film like Blade Runner is uh, considered... Uh, an important part of the cyberpunk genre, but that's influenced by film noir. So cyberpunk is like the extension of a film noir. Yeah. I also like steampunk. Oh yeah. I love that too. We did. A, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh pillar wasn't there, but me, Alex von Goldstein and rabbit did a whole show about retro futurism from like steampunk to like eighties, uh, vaporwave and cyberpunk and like this, Mid-century space age, and you know, uh, the guy who made Akira also made Steam Boy, which was a steampunk version of Akira. I've never really seen it. <laughs> Steam Boy sounds like a like, oh, yeah. a gay porn of a bunch of twinks in a steam room. Yeah, yeah, I, I've never Ew. seen the film, but <laughs> that name, I know. <laughs> Adventure Kid, it's been an excellent show. I'd like to uh, thank you for being on. Uh, We've covered a lot of interesting topics. Well, you're welcome, and God bless you. Uh, thanks, and God bless you, too. And uh, thanks, uh, Pillator. Talk to you next time, Adventure Kid. Okay. See ya.